come in, that's totally fine. I know it's hard to leave the coffee when it's after a couple of talks early in the morning. I'm Doug Sillers. I'm going to talk today about how to deliver fast and beautiful images and video on the web, on mobile. Um, I'll, I may say the web, I may say your app. They're kind of interchangeable, but we're just going to talk through it. Um, really quickly, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, um, but I've been traveling for the last two years with my family as a digital nomad throughout Europe. And I'm working as doing freelance developer relations, helping people talk with the, helping companies talk with developer communities. And I also do a lot with performance, helping web pages get faster, helping native apps get faster, working on ways to speed up the way uh, websites and apps load, because that's really important. And I lead workshops on performance images and video. A few years ago, I wrote a book on how to speed up Android apps. Uh, that URL is the PDF. I'll put it up on Twitter. I'll put the, all of my slides up on Twitter uh, after my talk, so you'll be able to get all the URLs and everything. So that's the PDF if you're interested in downloading that. And if you ever want to talk about developer relations or performance or images or whatever, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm really easy to find. Um, before we start talking about images, well, this is an image. Uh, this is in Switzerland in the Alps. And how many of you sort of get this nervous feeling thinking about walking across this walkway, which is essentially nailed into the side of an Alp? Anyone, right? Yeah, it's kind of, right. Um, we did this as a family, because I'm traveling with my family. And my daughter, who was six at the time, jumped the whole way, so it rattled as we walked across it. A few years ago, Ericsson did a study, and they put sensors on people's heads to understand stress responses to different um, stimuli. And they found that standing in line raises people's stress. They found that thinking about walking across the edge of a cliff raises people's stress responses. But really interestingly, they found that mobile delays are actually more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. So th that's important to think about because, you know, 90 seconds ago, you were thinking about standing on the edge of a cliff and we all felt a little nervous and, you know, that's... If your customers are interacting with your content and they're feeling like nervous or you know stressed out, they're less likely to hang around and use your site again. They're less likely to buy things, right? We want to keep people happy when they're buying things so they buy more. So speed is actually a really important aspect when it comes to building uh, mobile, any experience, but mobile experiences especially. There's a lot of research here. Google found that a three second delay causes half of your customers to leave. Um, another one of these put sensors on people's heads to measure their, their responses found that a half second delay increased frustration and lowered engagement. Amazon and Walmart independently about 20 years ago found that a 100 millisecond delay causes them to lose 1% of their revenue. But my favorite stat is 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. So what can we do to speed up the mobile experience? Well, I went into the HTTP archive, which is a a tool that looks at, at 4 million websites every month and collects all the information about what's loading on those web pages. And what we found is the average web page is 50% images and 25% video. And so if we can speed up the delivery of the video, we can speed up the delivery of the images, we're going to make the pages load a lot faster. Now, you may be surprised, like half a quarter of every web page is video. Well, what's actually happening here is the few websites that have video, video files are so ginormous that it throws off the average. So it's like if Bill Gates came and sat in the back of this room, our average salary would be $250 million a year. Um, so video is throwing off the average just because those files are so, so large. But what can we do to reduce the size of video and images? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So one fun thing about talking about images, I get to share pictures of my vacation and force you all to see pictures of, of where I've traveled throughout Europe. And this is Porto in Portugal. And I took this with my phone, you know, right here. We all have these awesome cameras in our pockets now. And it was eight megabytes. Now, obviously, you wouldn't want to put an eight megabyte image on the web or on an app because that just takes forever to download. Um, so we're going to talk about how we can optimize this image. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to optimize images. One way is to reduce the number of colors. Um, the week after I was in Porto, I got to go to Oslo. And it was a gray, cloudy, wet day. And this photo, same settings on my phone, is only 3.5 megabytes because it's grayscale. 
right? Uh, I cut out thousands and thousands of colors just because it was a crummy day. And this isn't to dig on Oslo. I'm from Seattle originally. This is what Seattle looks like for like nine months out of the year. Um, but what we can see here is just be by changing the colors and, and parameters with the same image, you can make images smaller. Now, Oslo would obviously never use this on their tourist website, whereas, you know, Porto might use that because that's actually a pretty cool picture. Um, but let's figure out ways that can optimize images where we can have small images on a really nice day. Um, and so I'm going to use a tool called Lighthouse. Does anyone know Lighthouse? Right, a bunch of hands, but Lighthouse is a, a free and uh, it's a free tool that measures and gives you ideas on how to speed up your web page on mobile, and it gives you all sorts of suggestions. And there are four image optimizations inside Lighthouse: quality of the images, the format of the images, the sizing of the images, and lazy loading. And Lighthouse gives you a score between zero and a hundred. It just recently changed to zero to one, so divide my scores by a hundred, and we're at the same place. Um, now, Lighthouse is built into a bunch of tools. You can run it on your own. You can run it in Chrome DevTools. It's also built inside of Web Page Test. And what's really cool is the HTTP Archive is built on top of Web Page Test. So for all of those websites that they scan every month, I get Lighthouse scores. And so I can see what's out there on the web today. What are web pages doing today when it comes to these four best practices? So let's walk through them. The first one is quality. So if you save an image with lower quality, you're removing pixels. It's a lossy uh, compression, right? We're going to remove pixels. But what Google has found is that if you save your image at 85%, in general, it's good enough for the web, and no one notices the difference. And so the Lighthouse recommendation is save your images at 85% quality. Sure, you're losing pixels, but our images are so big these days that removing 15%, nobody even notices. It's really easy to do. You can use a tool like Image Magic, save it at quality 85, bam, you get a quality 85 JPEG. Uh, there are cloud-based tools like Cloudinary. You upload the full-size image, and um, then you just change that parameter. You can see the Q85 in the URL, and that just generates the, Q80, the quality 85% image automatically. So what does that look like? Here's a picture that uh, I took on my phone again, 3.6 megabytes. I resize it to quality 85%, and it's half the size. I got it down to 1.8 megabytes. So you can't tell the difference. The image looks virtually identical, um, as far as I can tell. So we can go now back into the HTTP archive and see how we're doing on the web with saving our images at quality 85. And what we see is 43% of the web is passing completely, but a third of the web is failing. They're saving the images at a higher quality than 85%. And Lighthouse further goes on to tell you how much faster your web page would be if you did this optimization. So of that third of the internet that's failing, the 50th percentile would be 2.8 seconds faster. So you could speed up the load time by 2.8 seconds faster, and you could use 420 kilobytes less data. So that's a pretty significant improvement just by changing the images. Now. 85% is great. It's sort of like Google found a good percentage of where the right spot is to be. Um, but what if, what if we went better? Like, what if we saved it at 50%? And it's sort of hard to tell on this screen, but there is some, pixel, there's, there's some pixelization in the, in the sky when I save it at 50%. So that's too low a quality. If I go to 20%, it's really obvious. right? You can see that image just looks horrible, and you wouldn't use that on the web. Um, so we know 85% is probably good. We know 20% is bad. But where's that spot in the middle? And actually, there are tools that will do this for you. There's a tool called Buderaugli. There are a bunch of tools based on structural similarity. And what these tools do is they find that sweet spot where the human eye, they lower the quality until the human eye can perceive a difference. So if we lower the quality to where no one can see a difference, why not do that, right? It doesn't affect anything except for make the images smaller. Um, see JPEG DSSIM is a tool that you can use. It's open source. The URL's at the bottom. Again, Cloudinary, the parameter is QAuto, and it generates a structural similarity version of that image. And when I do that, uh, the file goes down another 400 kilobytes. So I mean, that's a pretty easy optimization. Save another 400 kilobytes from 1.8 to 1.46. Um, and there's the graph, so you can see that it did indeed drop. But what does that mean in terms of load time? So I can pop those into, into web page test on a 3G connection using a real Motorola G4 device, 
and the load time for the full size image is 21.7 seconds. Structural similarity is 9.4 seconds. So obviously it's more than twice as fast. Obviously the size is more than twice as small. So this is great. We're on the right, pro we're on the right step here. The next thing I'm going to talk about is optimizing the format. These images that I took on my phone are all JPEG. So what can we do to optimize that image? Are there different formats that will work well? These are the different formats that, you know, the, the, of the top formats that I found in the HTTP archive uh, and the average size. JPEG by far is the most popular format used on the web. It's also the largest, probably just because there's so many of them, right? It just, there's, the averages are all over the place. But let's talk about vector graphics really quickly, because vector graphics are a great way for icons and things to really reduce the size. And SVGs, they're, they're shapes. So you just draw a bunch of shapes. It's all based on XML. They're infinitely scalable, because they're all XML shapes. So you can stretch it and, and make it smaller, and it's just drawing the shape. And so the Twitter icon looks the same, same file, no matter how big I stretch it. Um, and it's XML, so you can just add it in line to your HTML. It's text. Um, how, so they can, they're generally very, very small, but you can screw them up. And so now here's an example of somebody who screwed it up. This was a little icon that was on a page. I, I, it's a target, right, essentially. And I, I looked at it, it was SVG, and I'm like, that's really, really large. Why is it so large? And if you look at the file, you see a bunch of circles, right? It's defining the circles. But then the second half of that screen, it says Adobe Illustrator and then just like metadata. And there's a lot of metadata. In fact, there's about 945 kilobytes of metadata, right? All you really need is the circle up there at the top. Um, so the optimization here is you go into your favorite text editor and you delete all the Adobe Illustrator stuff. And uh, it became one kilobyte. Um, so this was live in production. So you know this just kind of goes back to like when you push something live, you should probably just test to see what the heck is going on. And if you see an image that seems unreasonably large, you should see if you can optimize it. Because it's a text file, I can gzip it, right? I can use Broadly, which squeezes out a little bit more. Right, I'm down to half a kilobyte. I can inline that right into my HTML, and it doesn't even really affect the load time perceptively. Now, this same web page had an orange target, too. And they did exactly the same thing. So now we're talking 1.8 megabytes of circles that could be under 2 kilobytes. Even better, SVGs you can style. So you can style the red one to orange. And then you just have one SVG and a little bit of style. And it, it's really, really small, you know, way less than a kilobyte. So. If you're going to do SVGs, they're really awesome. You can do a lot of cool things with them that don't require downloading many, many files. Um, but when we talk about images, generally we're not talking about icons. I mean, there's a lot of optimization you can do there. Let's talk about photographs and you know, sort of typical images. And if you look, WebPs are it, the average WebP is half the size of a JPEG, and WebP is a newer format. It's actually based on a video format. It's based on VP8 um, video. It's essentially a one-frame video to make it an image. And if I had given this talk a year ago, you would have said, well, that's great. WebP is supported on Chrome and Android because it's a Google format. Um, but times have changed over the last year. It's now available in Edge. It's available in Firefox. And they're working on it in Safari. So we have three of the four major modern browsers supporting it. It's supported in Android. Um, you know, It's never going to come to IE or anything. but we're at already almost 75% of people using the web today. It's something that we can consider now. I mean, a lot of people are using it. Um, if I save that image that was 1.4 megabytes, if I save it as a WebP, I shave off another 400K. It's now under one megabyte. Um, I load it in web page test. It goes from 9.4 seconds to seven seconds. I shaved off another 2.5 seconds in load time on a 3G connection. And obviously, if you use a picture tag, you can serve the WebP for browsers that don't know how to use a WebP. It'll fall back to the JPEG to serve a JPEG. And then, of course, you should always have an alt tag for people who can't see the images anyway. If we look into the HTTP archive, uh, a full two-thirds of the web are not using these, the alternative format of uh, WebP. And it also looks for JPEG 2000. These tests are run on Chrome, so they're looking for WebP specifically. Um, 
if it had been used, the median site that didn't use it would be 4.1 seconds faster and use 600K less data. I mean, we're talking pretty huge improvements in speed and load time just by making the images smaller because images are so, are so, uh, they're so large. If we're just changing the format, we can make them a lot smaller and the page loads faster. The third optimization is resizing images. And this is sort of something that a lot of people understand, right? You have a different image for this versus this. You don't want to serve down two megabyte images to a mobile phone because it takes forever. And you know, here's the example. Image, it's 13 megapixels. Um, I took it with my phone, it's 1.6 megabytes. I save it as a WebP. Structural similarity, I get it half the size to 800K. That's still really, really large. Um, and it's still 13 uh, megapixels. What happens when you serve it to a mobile device? Right, That mobile device can only display 500,000 pixels. So we're throwing away like 95% of the data. Right? You have to download 13 million pixels, and then you're throwing away 12 and a half million before it can show up on the screen. And the best analogy I can come for that is when you order something and it comes in a box, and this happens a lot with Amazon, where you order something from Amazon and there's like eight meters of brown paper in the box, and in the bottom there's like a pencil. And they shipped it in this giant box. And that's what we're doing with our images. We can optimize our images so we don't have to send such, such a huge payload to every single user. Further upon that, if you're on a low-powered mobile device, when the CPU fires up to throw away 95% of the data, it can take a long time because the device is slow. So if you do this, I actually looked at this in Chrome DevTools. Um, on a desktop, it, on a 3G connection, the image took 14 seconds to download. It took 78 seconds for it to resize it. On a Motorola G4, it took 218 milliseconds. But on the Alcatel 1X, which is an Android Go device, it's a very low-powered device. It's like 79 euros, right? It's a really cheap, low-end device. Um, but it took 820 milliseconds for it to decode. So you're almost waiting a whole nother second after the file's on the device before it can show up on the screen. And if we start looking at all of the Android devices that are out there, um, this, the size of the box is how many of each device hit Akamai in one day. The color of the box is how fast the CPU is. You can see there are a lot of really slow CPUs, right? The red means it's a slow device. So we have all these different screen sizes, and a lot of them are really slow. So for sending images that are too large, we're getting that delay that I showed right here on a lot of those devices, that 820 millisecond delay. So the solution here is obviously responsive images. Serve a different size image for the right size device. Um, one application is to generate a bunch of images 25 kilobytes different in size. That could be a lot of images. That might be too many for what you're looking for. Maybe five or three is the right approach. Um, but when I did that, I created a bunch of different sizes. And now my phone is only throwing away 100,000 pixels versus 12.5 million. Huge improvement. This is going to load up really fast on the screen. The tool I used was a re responsive breakpoint generator. It's open source. You can download the code at GitHub and you know, make this part of your uh, content management system. So every time you upload an image, it resizes all the images for you. Um, I used the web, the web interface of it. So I said I want images between 200 pixels wide and 1,400 pixels wide, 25 kilobytes apart. Give them all to me. And it helped me build a web page with all of the different size images. So the right size image is delivered to the correct device. And so now when I test that image on a mobile phone, the image has shrunk down because I'm serving the right number of pixels, right? It's, it's almost perfect for this device within 25 kilobytes. And now the image is only 121K, and I shaved another five seconds off the load time. So I've taken it from 21 seconds with the full size image, resized, quality resize, changed the format, I made it responsive, and now it's only two seconds to show up on the screen. So if you do this to all of the images, obviously you're really going to speed up the delivery of your content. When we look at the HTTP archive, 60% of the web is doing this right. 20% is not. The 20% that could change the responsive images, they would save 2.7 seconds on load time and about 400K. So, you know, again, these optimizations really do speed up the delivery of your content. Now, the first three optimizations for images are specific just to images, to, to each specific image. Lazy loading is more of a 
you know, a holistic for your whole site idea. And the idea is, if I've got all of these images on my web page, only the deliver the ones that show up on the screen. Because if you only show the ones that are going to be on the screen at any given time, now I only have to load two images as opposed to six. And then you have some JavaScript that causes, that, that with the intersection observer, discovers when the image is going to be on the screen and it, it downloads it. Or maybe it downloads a little bit ahead of time so the images are always there. Um, if we look at lazy loading from, uh, from Lighthouse, it shows that 60% of the internet is not doing this. And by lazy loading, the median site would be three and a half seconds faster. So it's something definitely to consider if you're really worried about loading. The image is way down on the bottom of your page. Load them later. Load the ones that show up on the top of the screen first, because obviously that's most important. We've seen lazy loading on a lot of sites. Medium does it. Pinterest does it. Facebook does it. It's, this is something that isn't really new. This is uh, Google image search. When you search for cats in costume, you get colored placeholders. They're probably SVGs. You know, 500 bytes each, and then the color corresponds to whatever image is going to show up. The green is for the the cat dressed up like a uh, dinosaur. You can go a little fancier. There's an open source library that creates a textured SVG, so you can see the waterfall is now a little bit more colored. There's some white and green. Um, I, again, that's a little fancier. That background image is 500 bytes compressed, so that loads up almost immediately and then it gets replaced once the full-size image is downloaded. Um, so as an experiment, I built a web page. This is from Chrome DevTools zoomed out. Each line is a screen view, right? So there's like five screen views on my desktop. And when I load this page with Chrome today, it looks like this. You can see the text is continually reflowing as more and more images appear. You can also see that in, in slice number four, there's an image of a cow about halfway down, but the images where you're actually looking as a user haven't even downloaded yet. So it's downloading the images sort of in whatever order the browser decides to download the images in, which is not the order that they're consumed by the end user. So if we had lazy loading turned on here, the idea would be we'd load those four images at the top of the screen first, and then worry about all the images below later. So without lazy loading, you know, we've got images at the bottom loading, whereas the stuff at the top still hasn't appeared yet. Now in Chrome, there's you, behind a flag, you can turn on lazy loading, and the browser will do lazy loading for you. So this is kind of exciting because we don't have to do our own JavaScript for it. Um, but Chrome actually, what it does is it, if it sees that there's an image on the page, it downloads the first two kilobytes of every image. And in those first two kilobytes, it gets the dimensions and the location of where the image is going to be. So you can see here by number three, the entire page is laid out. Right? It knows where all the images are going to be. It knows the size of all the images. You don't get any of those crazy page reflows, like when you're scrolling and stuff pops in and you have to figure out where you were reading in the article or whatever. Um, but the other cool thing is now the browser knows where all the images are. And because it knows where all the images are, it can load the images from top to bottom the way that they're consumed by the end user. So you can actually see the images are loading from the top to the bottom. The cow only appears you know, when it's in its order going down the page. So that's really exciting if the browser can do this for us. Um, obviously, it's only Chrome, but you know, this is something that will c is coming in browsers soon, which is really, really neat. So those are the four Lighthouse um, image optimizations. And as I start my shift over into talking about how to optimize video, uh, the obvious segue is animated GIFs, right? Because it's sort of an image, but it's sort of a video. And so this is an image of uh, a video I took on my phone. It's Nora the goat. Um, the video on my phone was 1.4 megabytes. I turned it into an animated GIF, right? This is Nora eating a leaf. And it became 3.8 megabytes when I turned it into a GIF. And the reason for that is... Um, GIFs don't have compression through the scale of time like video files do. And if you go back to 1990 and you actually read the specification for, uh, for GIFs, it says the GIF format is not intended as a platform for animation, even though you can do it with animated GIFs. So what that's telling us is, you know, I, what I think is great is GIF the medium is great, but GIF the format isn't so awesome. And the reason for that is we don't get that compression through time. So if your animated GIF is, is set up at uh, 
15 frames per second, it's literally 15 GIFs that it's flipping through every single second. And so that means that you don't get very good compression. These files are really large, and they take a long time to download. Um, so what do you do if I make this in a, a movie again with 256 colors? I strip out the audio track because animated GIFs are silent. It's now 250K, and I can use that. But you might be thinking, animated GIFs are everywhere. Like, Twitter uses animated GIFs, right? You can see in the corner it says GIF, but they're lying. Twitter is actually serving an MP4. They're serving it as a movie, because when it's served it as a movie, it's only 300K. And if it had been an animated GIF, it would have been several megabytes. And so in terms of storage, in terms of delivery time, all of these things, you do it as a movie. And the way you do it as a movie is you use the video tag, uh, loop, autoplay, right? You want it to loop, you want it to autoplay. You have to set it to muted. And you have to set it to muted so that it autoplays on mobile. Muted is required in the video tag to autoplay on mobile. And the reason for that is Safari engineers and Chrome engineers sit in in meetings too, right? And if they open a web page and it starts blasting the video, we're all busted. So um, it has to be muted. Um, one really cool thing you can do in Safari is you can actually put MP4s inside the picture tag, and it'll, it'll play it. So if you put the movie inside the picture tag, you can load an MP4 instead of an animated GIF. Uh, Chrome will fall back to the animated WebP in this example, and then everybody else gets the animated GIF. And why that's really cool is the video file loads in four and a half seconds. That's super fast for your Safari users, whereas everyone has to fall back to the animated GIF. It takes 22 seconds for that to download over 3G. So you can see where the advantage is to make sure that you're getting um, a video file as opposed to the animated GIF. So as we move from GIFs into video, one of the most, Im yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. No, go, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So MP4 is pretty good, though. It's, it's on most. So the question is, MP4, does it work? You have to find the right codecs. The default codecs and things like FFmpeg, it's going to work on just about every modern browser, and you'll be OK. I mean, you can further, video gets very complicated when we start talking about the different codecs and the different you know, packages and things. Um, if you just go default, you know, the defaults with um, FFmpeg, in general, it's going to work on every single browser. So you'll, you'll be OK. It will work. Um, but as we move into video, um, one of the major um, analytics companies that looks at video was measuring how people consume video. And what they found was that this is like 16 billion views in Q3 of, of last year. And they found that on desktop and mobile, 3% of all videos fail to start after someone presses play. Like the video just doesn't even work. And what m even more interestingly, 16% on mobile and almost 30% on desktop, they press play, the video should have worked, but we gave up before it actually started playing. Like have, you've done that, right? Where you press play and like, this isn't starting, I'm gonna go do something else. Um, can you imagine if we built a web page or built an app that didn't work 16% of the time, right? We need to optimize our video so that it shows up on the screen. Um, so let's look at the ones that fail to start up. I think a lot of them is stuff like this, like just geo fencing of videos. So here I am trying to load something from America, and obviously it's not available when I'm here. Um, Amazon does this slightly differently inside the Amazon application. They'll say, oh, you're not in the United States right now. These are the videos you can watch when you get back home, but here's what you can watch now, right? So it doesn't let me get to this step like I get all excited that I can watch a movie and then it's not available because of my location. Um, even worse, when I loaded this page, it took 231 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me oops, right? I mean, that's a lot of data um, just to tell me oops. Um, but you know, I think even more important are these videos. Like, How is it that 16% of videos on mobile just 
they press play, it should work, and they didn't actually start. And like 30% on desktop. And what it comes down to is the average startup time was three seconds on mobile, and for some reason it was six seconds on desktop, right? So this is gets in again to like, if it takes a long time to start up, people are just gonna give up, right? You get tired of waiting for things to start. And there's other research to show this. Uh, this is from Akamai, and what they said is everyone will wait two seconds. If you see a video and you press play, 99 point some percent of your users will wait two seconds for it to start playing. But between second and two and three, you lose 6% of your users. Every additional second, you lose 6% of your users. And that changes quite s slightly um, if it's a short video. So if it's a short video, is uh, like a cat dressed up like a shark on a Roomba chasing a duck. After about four seconds, you're like, what the heck? And you give up, right? Like, I've got more important things to do with my life than to watch that. But if you're watching a TV show or a movie, you're already setting aside 40 minutes or an hour or two hours. You're going to hang on, like, waiting 10 seconds isn't that big a deal. So people will wait. Um, so what causes the startup delay for videos? Well, one thing is, here's a web page that I found that on the desktop, it downloads 2.67, or no, sorry, 267 kilobytes of video on the on the home page. On mobile, it downloads double that. So why are we downloading more data on mobile than we are on desktop? Um, well, it turns out that the mobile device that we were testing on was not Retina, whereas the mobile device was Retina. So it's downloading a Retina version of the video. So that's why it's double the amount of video. It's going to take twice as long for that to download. Um, and we can see that in the, in the source code, right? If it's Retina, download the Retina, otherwise do do the regular version of the video. To make matters worse, the video doesn't even show up on the mobile site, so it's downloading half a megabyte of video, um, and they hide it with the CSS. <laughs> so like, if you're going to download video onto mobile, um, make sure that it's going to show up on the screen. Um, this is actually a recurring theme through this video section of the talk. You'll see this a couple times. So. Um, Make sure that it's going to show up on the screen. If you want to make sure that the video is downloaded and it's going to start very, very quickly, you can use the tag preload equals auto. And that tells the browser, no matter what, this is the web page test waterfall, download the video. That's really good if you know people are going to watch the video. However, this was just some web pages. This was just some home page. And at the bottom of the page, there's a video. And most of the time, I don't click that. I don't know about all of you, but generally I don't watch the video on every single web page that I visit. Um, in this case, it downloaded 23.6 megabytes of video to every single person who visits that page. There's an expense there in terms of time, in terms of server costs. I mean, there's a lot going on here. It's very expensive. Um, you should really only use preload equals auto if you're like 90% sure they're going to watch the video. If they're not going to watch the video, there's no reason to spend all that time downloading the file. Um, the default in most browsers is preload equals metadata. And what that does is it downloads the first 2 or 3% of the video. And so you can see in this waterfall, there's a green line. Um, and that's the video downloading. So that's great for, you know, medium. Uh, uh, if, they're gonna, if there's a medium chance that they're going to download the video. In this case, the video they had on their web page was like 150 megabytes. So it ended up downloading like 6 megabytes of video where most of the time people aren't going to watch it. So you should still be careful with using preload equals metadata, or maybe you shouldn't have a 150 megabyte video on your web page. Like, your mileage may vary. It's, it's obviously something to think about. A common thing that's happening on, on a lot of web pages is having background videos. There's a study out there showing that um, web pages that have a background video have 80% more engagement than web pages that don't have background videos. That's sold by a company that wants to sell you a service of putting background videos on the web page, right? Um, but, you know, it's really cool. It's, it's very much more engaging. You know, there's, there's a lot more interactiveness, it seems, to have that video on there. Um, I, the reason I found this background video when I was going through all of the data is most background videos are called, like, background.mp4 or background video. Um, this one was called Steven. And so I wanted to see what the heck was going on. And it turns out this video is 5.3 megabytes, which for yeah, that's, that's reasonable. Um, but it wasn't silent. There was a narration going on. 
Like, so there's an audio track for a video that you never hear the audio for. And so by s merely stripping out the audio track, you can make the file 5% smaller. You can make it 5 megabytes. Um, so if, there is no, if you're not going to hear the audio, remove that whole stream from the track. Um, you can't just mute the track because there still is a track that just is an empty container, essentially. So you have to have to remove the stream. Um, that goes for the animated GIF movies as well. If there's no audio, you shouldn't have any audio. Um, of course, this is the mobile waterfall, and you can see the green lines at the bottom. It's the video downloading. They hide it on mobile devices, so you just get a background um, image. Um, they had a fallback JPEG that's 900K. They hide that too. Yeah, just test, right? I mean, this is just sort of simple testing. Here's another web page with a background video. This is sort of the classic it works on my machine sort of video. If you hang out here at the top of this page on a really, really, really fast connection, you'll see it in about five seconds. But no one sits at the top of a web page for five seconds in the hopes that maybe a video will show up. Um, this is the beginning of the video. Um, I don't know if, uh, so Bob Ross is also a photographer, we've learned from this video. Um, the video is 33 megabytes. That's a little bit large for a background video, right? I mean, that's just extra data that has to be downloaded. It's like almost 30 seconds long. Like, why? Like, who stands at the top of a web page for 30 seconds? Nobody. Um, it's 2,500 pixels by 1,200 pixels. Like, it doesn't fit the normal size of any real device that's out there. And it's 10 megabits per second. So really, what would say make this video so much smaller is to resize it. Right? Just remove a bunch of the pixels, just like we did with images. Um, pro tip, if you name it 720p, that doesn't re-encode it to 720p. Um, it is new. Um, so what I did is I uploaded that video into Cloudinary. There are a lot of ways you can resize videos. You can do it with FFmpeg. Cloudinary is really easy because you can just set a parameter. And when I set it to 720p, it became 4 megabytes. Four megabytes, again, I'm not going to argue. That's reasonable. Put that up live. You're good to go. Um, it downloads on mobile, right? We, recurring theme, right? If you're not going to show it on mobile, don't download it. Um, and that sort of comes back to video isn't cheap. It costs your customers money. It costs, you know, you have to have data server costs. You know, there's, uh, there's a cost there. Um, in this case, it downloaded 17 megabytes before it gave up, and if someone's roaming, that could be really, really expensive. Uh, my mobile plan, I got the chance to go to Russia last December, and um, I looked up what the roaming costs were, and it was uh, 10 euros a megabyte. So that's 170 euros for a video that I never see, right? I know it's an extreme edge case, but it will happen to somebody at some point. Um, so video isn't cheap. This is Garth Brooks' website. He's a singer from America. I don't know if you know him or not. Um, I recorded this on my desktop. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, I've got one of those speed up things where you can speed up videos. I use it when I'm watching conference talks, so I can watch it at one and a half and you know, get through the talks a lot faster. If you look really carefully, there's another one up here because there's a background video playing behind the video. There's two videos playing simultaneously here on the screen. Um, so you can see that the, the video of him singing is the Notre Dame television. It's 51 megabytes. You can see there's a seven megabyte uh, background video. And then I talked about animated GIFs. There's a 6.2 megabyte animated GIF playing as well, saying, buy my next album. They're all being hosted at S3. And that's great. S3 is a great place to, to store these sorts of files. Um, but we've got about 60. 567 megabytes of stuff being s served from S3 without a CDN, so it's just coming straight out of Amazon every time someone hits this web page. Now, if you go to Amazon, you find out that uh, every gigabyte costs nine cents that goes out to the internet. So every single time this page loads, it costs them half of a penny in S3 costs, right? You get a lot of people hitting this web page you're going to end up with a huge Amazon bill, potentially. Throw in there, there's a bug in Chrome that large videos aren't cached. 
So if you download, if you keep, stay on this web page and that 51 megabyte video loads twice, it gets downloaded twice. So here I am, I sat on that web page for 20 minutes and I downloaded that video five times. That's two and a half cents. I mean, it, it adds, it's small, but it will add up over time. So for things like that, you might want to think about video streaming. And so when you do video streaming, you split up all of the different, um, you have a bunch of different bit rates. So it serves the right size and the right bit rate stream for the device you're using. And so this is what a manifest file looks like. And this is what tells the player what's available. You have a bunch of streams at the top right there. And then these are all of the audio tracks. And in this case, it's a TED talk that I'm looking at the manifest file. And they have subtitles for like 20 different languages, which is really interesting. Um, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the video. And so what you see here is you get a list of different streams with different bandwidths and different resolutions. And what happens is the device says, the speed of my network is X, the size of the screen is Y, I'm going to pick the right one of these to deliver my content. And so when you do that, you end up with the right size, sp the right speed video for that application, for that device. And it ends up looking great for all of your users. And I'd love to talk more about streaming, but I know I'm going to run out of time if I get into streaming. Um, so we can chat about that afterwards if you're interested. There are a lot of other things we can do to improve the performance of delivering video and delivering uh, images to on the web and in apps. One thing that's really cool is there are now ways that our end users can tell us what they want. One of those is the Save Data header. Inside Chrome, on your mobile device, you can turn on Data Saver mode, and that adds a header that says Save Data. Um, this is a, a, a guy from Belgium who found that 5% of his users are actually saying, save data, don't send as much stuff to me as you can. So he actually went and re-architected his website to remove the videos. These people are asking not to have videos served to them, so he removed them. He's serving the, the fewer images because they don't want the images. So imagine if you're the BBC and someone says, save data, maybe you remove some of the images, right? The content's still there, but you remove some of the images. Um, tools like Cloudinary, if they see that, they automatically get more aggressive in the compression of the images. They go from Q-Auto to Q-Auto Eco. They squeeze out another 45 kilobytes out of that image, making it smaller. The customer says, I don't really care as much about quality as in saving the data. So if they're telling you to do that, do that. There's also a network info API. So if someone's on a really slow network, maybe you don't want to serve them video. I had the chance to live in rural Ireland for a month, and my Airbnb told me that I had Wi-Fi. But it didn't have the subtlety that the Wi-Fi was on a 3G router that really only had edge connection, right? And so when I was on the Wi-Fi at home and I went to Facebook, I never saw any videos. Because Facebook knew I was on such a crappy connection that I would get frustrated if I tried to watch a video on that slow a connection. When I went out and I was on a faster connection, the videos all miraculously reappeared for me to see. And they're using something like this Network Info API. So there's a, you know, in your JavaScript, you can actually measure the downlink speed. And it will tell you the network speed is 500 kilobits per second. Well, if it's a slow network speed, maybe you serve smaller images, fewer images, remove the videos to make sure that your page loads quickly. Um, another thing that I've had a lot of people ask me about is what if I take my images base64 and code them and just put them up as text, sort of like an SVG file. Um, the problem with the good thing about that is you have fewer requests, but you're blocking the, the images are now blocking the HTML from downloading or the CSS or whatever. Um, when you base64 and code your images, they get larger. You can't cache them. You can't reference them a lot. This is a web page that had this star. The other hard thing about base64 encoding is you can't figure out what the heck it is. Like if I said star.gif or star.jpg, I know what it is. But it's just a bunch of, it's a string of, you know, hex. You can't even read what it is. They have 16 instances of this star in one CSS file. And they have 16. In between the highlight, where it's not highlighted, that's the open star. They had 16 versions of the open star in this CSS file, just ballooning this file out to this crazy size. Um, 
not recommended to do. Um, so in conclusion, thanks for hanging in with me. Um, we've done, talked a lot about how to optimize images and how to optimize video for delivery on the web, into apps, onto mobile, et cetera. We can optimize the image quality, format. We can resize them for the device. We can lazy load our images, so we only show the images that are on the screen. Turn all of your animated GIFs into movies. Don't base 64 and code the images. And if your customers say, save data, serve smaller images. That also goes for video. Um, and for video, we can optimize the videos for the screen. Only download the videos if they're going to show up on the screen. We can change the bit rate. Right? We can lower the quality of the video so they appear. Streaming is more efficient for longer videos, so we should look at that. And finally, if you don't optimize your video, it can be very, very expensive and cost both you and your customers a lot of money. Um, here are a bunch of the tools that I used. Web page test, the HTTP archive, some of the image optimization tools that I used. Um, again, I'll post the slides so you can get all of those URLs later. Um, images can be fast and beautiful, so that's really, really, uh, that's the takeaway, is we can optimize them so they get downloaded quickly and they can show up on the screen quickly. If you're really interested in building with video images, uh, Cloudinary has a media developer expert program, and you can email them to find out more about that. So if, if you're interested, that's a cool thing. They, they have a lot of ways that can help you with that. Um, and so with that, thank you very much. I'll leave this slide up. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah. So in that case, um, it's a great question. So the question is, what should I do in terms of fallback? Because I still needed to support, I think you said IE7. Um, uh, in that case, you still need to have a JPEG as a fallback. Um, let's see here. Let me find the right slide. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's not, now you have two versions of the same image. Or if you have different sizes, maybe you have multiple sizes of the same image. Um, but the, the speed that you get by optimizing, um, right, so here, here's a picture tag, right? So you have the WebP, and that's what the browsers that support the WebP, and then everybody else gets the JPEG. So inside the picture tag, you can have different media types, and the browser will pick the first one that it understands to put it on the screen. So again, you have to have two different video, or two different images. Um, for a long time, Lighthouse actually says WebP JPEG 2000, which is a modern version of JPEG, and then fall back to JPEG. Um, JPEG 2000 is in Edge, Firefox, and Safari. So that gets you all the major modern browsers. Now WebP gets you three of the four. So it makes it a little easier because you don't need, soon you won't need three formats, you'll only need two. So that's, that's why it's exciting that, it's all, that most of the browsers are going to WebP. You don't have to encode three different versions of every single image. Cool. Well, if you have any other questions, I'll hang out here for a little bit. I'll be around the rest of the day. And I appreciate you all coming and listening. I thank you so much.